The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. And welcome this morning. We have uh, four cases that will be submitted. Um, those cases are State of Iowa versus Charles Raymond Albright, State of Iowa versus Christopher Ryan Clavel, State of Iowa versus Kenneth Edward Petty, and the final case is State of Iowa versus Bernard Anthony Smith. Now, the last three cases will now be submitted to the court without oral argument, and we'll hear the arguments in State versus Albright. Ms. Lucy. Good morning. I'm here today representing Charles Albright on his conviction for kidnapping first and willful injury causing bodily injury. Court debt is a significant problem here in Iowa and nationwide. I think the parties agree that the district court is required to consider a defendant's reasonable ability to pay uh, court costs, attorney fees, um, legal assistance fees, and other um, restitution within that statute. The question becomes, when is the district court required to make that consideration? Part of the issue is we have two different categories, right? You have uh, court cost fees where ability to pay goes into whether you can even assess the amount in the first place, right? Correct. And then you have things like victim restitution where the assessment is mandatory, ability to pay just enters into the plan, isn't that right? Yes. So isn't it more logical to just look at everything at the time of the plan? Not at the plan, because it matters what the amount is. Because with victim restitution, as long as there is that causal relationship, that amount is required by law, it's mandatory. But the, the code allows you to, I mean, I, I, I just don't see this order following the code where the, the court is allowed to enter temporary orders. Correct. And then there's a final order. And wouldn't it make more sense for the court, well, it would make more sense all this stuff be available at the time of sentencing, right? Yes. And that's what the code, code anticipates, but it never is. So they have this temporary order scheme. I mean, wouldn't it make more sense for the court to enter temporary orders as to amounts as place, place holders, even to those amounts that are subject to reasonable ability to pay? And then when it enters its final order, do all the adjustment? I, I would disagree with that, and, I, and it's for a couple of reasons. One, if you don't consider it at the time that the order is entered, the defendant has to start paying that immediately. And if they can't make those payments, or you know, up front, all of it is due at the time of sentencing, or a payment plan. Pay Does the code require that you start paying on the temporary orders? I mean, the, the, the code makes that distinction, I think it's subsection three, where they say there's temporary orders and there's final order, and it doesn't say on those temporary orders they have to start paying. No, but the court rule says that it's due immediately. And the legislature used to have a, a code section that required that immediate payment, just like the, the court rule does now. We could correct that with the court rule or correct it saying that temporary payments aren't due until the final payments entered. And I think you can, but then, then the next problem is, is that when is there a final order? Sometimes that could be years. What's the impact of uh, the collection of court debt statute that you um, brought to our attention with your notice of additional authority? The, the impact is that several things, depending on who is doing that collection, there is an automatic uh, fee that that is imposed, that 25% if it's a private collection. And that's an addition, not, you know, they get 25% of what the defendant owes. It's an additional fee. And then the other significance is that court debt is not ever forgiven for 65 years. 
So, I mean, that is an awful long time to have this hanging over the head of people who don't have the reasonable ability to pay. But when you say, when you say court debt, fines and fees aren't subject to ability to pay. No. And uh, restitution to the victim isn't subject to ability to pay. No. So you're only talking about, what we're really talking about is the incarceration fees most of the time while you're in the county jail and attorney fees and expert witness, those type things. And court costs. And, vic and what the state has paid in the victim rest in Victim rest compensation. Yeah. Um, you also have uh, the uh, amount to local agencies, uh, medical assistance. Those are the things that are subject to reasonable ability to pay. I don't, I don't disagree with the idea that oftentimes the district court does not have this information at the time of sentencing. And, but then when the, the order, the supplemental orders are filed later on, defendant no longer has appointed counsel. They have 30 days after the, the case is done. There's never a, a look back of, oh, we have more, more restitution requested. We have, but we have a, a case that says if you contest that amount within 30 days, you do get counsel appointed. And can't you at that contested hearing raise reasonable ability to pay? But then again, you're, you're, you say the collection's immediate. Right, and, but the difficulty becomes when you look at the case law, Jans talked about the idea that you didn't have to exhaust the remedy of 907.10. So, 910.7, I got it backwards. So, but then you have subsequent cases that say, oh no, that's required, Schwartz and Jackson. Schwartz and Jackson claim to be talking about a plan of payment which is subject to modification. But, well, you, but you could distinguish those cases because one of them was based on a final order and one was based on supplemental orders. I think if you read Jans, Jackson, and Jose is the, the uh -huh. one that summarizes them all, they did that because there's a continual uh, assessment. It's not just one assessment. If you go back to Harris, and it's Harrison, I think those are the Harrison, old ones. Harrison, Haynes. Th those are Haynes, those are the ones where it was assessed and we said you cannot um, uh, assess without taking in, a, in effect the ability to pay. Right. And what those later cases seem to say is that we're not saying you can't assess with the ability to pay, but we're not going to take that up until it's assessed and defendant moves to say it's not right. I mean, that's, that's what it, I think they say. Am I, am I wrong on that? Well, I, I think, I think in a, it, so, it sounds like it should be Jose, but it's actually Joe's. My office represented him, and so we remember that. Um, but he, no matter how you want to, what you want to call him, that's the case that then interprets Jackson and Schwartz as being a plan of a plan of payment. But Jackson and Schwartz don't even talk about pay, plan of payment, nor do they have the code section for that. Code section talks about plan of restitution, so they are two separate things. And they are, and I mean that's that's what's so confusing is we've chosen to use different, you know, the very similar terms for the two different things. What's the best path forward? I, I would submit to the best path forward, and probably the easiest path forward, is that if you have amount of court costs, which is done electronically, I mean, I think the district court could have that amount. And if you have attorney fees, which oftentimes you're not going to have at that time, the order, whether it's form order or not, should not assess those costs until there is an amount. And then if you do supplemental orders, the defendant should have a right to a hearing unless he or she waives that hearing. Because Does, the we, Does the defendant have to be brought back from prison if they're in prison for those hearings? If you look at it and it's part of sentencing, which is going to increase the sentence, they have a right to be personally present and they have a right to have a lawyer represent them. Now, I think another option that could happen, and I think it would be acceptable, is that if you look at the financial affidavit of a defendant at the time he or she gets appointed counsel, you know how much money they have at that time. If they'd been in jail, you know that they don't have any more money. And you could say, Based upon everything, you know, what is, you know, do you have income? Anything from your financial changed? You're going to prison. Um, Van Hoff talks about, you know, his expenses are paid. 
well, that's not true anymore. If you look at what the, the canteen or the commissary that you have to pay things for, there are pay for stay in prison. There's a whole bunch of things. But if you look at all of those together and then you say, okay, based upon your reasonable ability to pay, I'm not going to order court costs, or I am, up to this amount. I'm going to say that you, don't, you do or you don't have the ability to pay court attorney fees up to this amount. Or what, is wrong, what is wrong with the court, though, saying um, the attorney fees for this case are, I'm going to pick a figure, $10,000, okay? And that's probably too high, but $10,000. Oh, no. <laughs> and, but your reasonable ability to pay is $2,000. So I'm going to assess you two thousand dollars, or I'm going to assess you nothing. But if I read uh, subsection seven, the state has a right to come back to maybe make the person pay the whole ten thousand dollars. Say the person wins the lottery. Say the person inherits a farm. Say the person comes into some money. I mean, uh, isn't that contemplated by the statute? I don't know if it's actually contemplated by the statute once the amount is chosen. Now, if there is, you know, if you have a, a, a payment plan where in, we know the total amount, say the total amount is $2,000, and something changes and they have the reasonable ability to pay that quicker or slower, that modification can happen. Now, well, you want reasonable ability to pay in two circumstances, one setting the amount and one setting the plan. And it seems to me it'd be fair to the state and the government that if, if some guy wins the lottery or some gal wins the lottery or inherits a farm or has some money 10 years down the road, because the code says you have to, you have to renew these as judgments. So the judgment isn't gonna be good more than 20 years and a lien's gone in 10 years if you file civil law. I, if you do that, uh, if the state does that or somebody does that, why shouldn't they have the right to come in and have that increased? once there's a change in the defendant's ability to pay. When does it end then? When they've discharged their sentence and they're done and they're free and clear? No, it ends when the state fails to register the lien and renew the judgment. And that's, that's set by a statute and the code, code requires it. Just like in a civil case, you know, they may, they may say restitution to the victim of $10,000 if that victim doesn't uh, renew the judgment or renew the lien after 10 or 20 years, that's gone. I mean, it, it's gone to them. And, and I may have to disagree with you a little bit. I'm not sure anyone is actually filing judgments out of this. Now, can they? Yes. But does that happen? Because if you look at what the rest of the code talks about is the person cannot get off probation until they have paid their restitution. In the olden days, we used to do confessions of judgment like you're talking about, Justice Wiggins. I'm not sure that's permissible anymore. So the, the question becomes, when is a person finally able to move on and this sentence? Understand, you know, kind of following up on your office's vision of how this should occur. So in what seems to be the commonplace situation, the defendant is sentenced, but the fees and costs are not available at the sentencing hearing, then the clerk gets those numbers within a few days, and then before they're assessed, there has to be another hearing? Is that what you're saying? I think it depends on what the, the, the record actually is. So like, if, if we're talking about court costs, that's, that's added pretty much automatically without any further order, and attorney fees is too. So if, you, if we have not done any analysis of re reasonable ability to pay, I think that the defendant, for a change in the sentence, is entitled to either have a hearing or waive that hearing. <coughs> not the other way around where the defendant has to request it. Because if you look at what this court said in Coleman just All right, recently. Okay, and, and, I'm, you know, and I, I, I share your view that the cases are challenging to reconcile. Yeah. And, and I and think the state does too. And uh, I think that that's the problem. But, 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 then, but then let's say down the road there's a, a, a restitution hearing and restitution is ordered. That would be then a, a second hearing on, on am I correct? It, it could be. And, 
and then there might be yet a third hearing on the plan of restitution, right? That would be a different type of, of, of hearing because that would be under the 910.7, which is not required automatically. Because it, it depends on whether the defendant's in prison and we have DOC statutorily, that's what's gonna happen. Whether we have them on probation. Right. I, I hear you, because there's a formula if they're in prison. But, but then what if the argument is made, well, I, 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 it used to appear that I had ability to pay court costs and attorney's fees, but now that I'm hit with this restitution, I don't have the ability to pay. What, what about then? Who's, whose burden is it to raise that issue? At, at that point, I think statutorily it goes to 910.7 because it allows for the plan of payment to be modified or the plan of restitution to be modified. I want to so make sure I understand. Um, Justice Waterman asked a question, what's the path? I want you to imagine you're in a, in a courtroom on a motion day and there's like 50 or 60 cases on the docket and there's sentencing after sentencing and many times um, the defendants waive their motion and arrest of judgment. They want to go straight. So the big issue is, am I going to jail? Am I going to the pen? Mm -hmm. That is hands down the most important thing pe people are talking about. And so talking about, well, I, I don't want to minimize them. On that day, they are minimized. So what do you envision when, when, when the, the court cannot know the court costs exactly? And yeah, the clerk will calculate it. But at that moment, we don't know. Um, at that moment, we certainly don't know the attorney's fees because there might be more lawyer time that day. I don't know. And um, many times we don't know the victim restitution amount yet, but we allow usually a restitution order to be, or request to be made by the state. Defendant, you have 30 days to object. What do you envision? Exactly tell me exactly where it is you say things are going sideways because it is, it is very difficult on a motion day Justice Katie, I'm, I'm out of time. May I finish? Um, and and I, I sympathize with that because I used to work in Waterloo. I understand what that's like. But I think what, what I envision is that the, the judge at the time makes a decision between what, what, is, your, what is your sentence going to be, probation, incarceration, whatever. And then when it moves on, when the judge moves on to restitution, I think the judge then can say, do we know amount of attorney fees, court cost, jail fees, whatever? Let's and, assume they don't. Okay, don't know that. And so judge um, asks the defense lawyer, what do you believe is your client's ability to pay? Has there been a change in financial circumstances? So you think that conversation should happen right then? When, when everybody's admitting we have no clue what those numbers are? I think that that's a start because then they may say, you know, I have no money, I'm going to prison for 50 years, I'm gonna have no money. And at that point, depending on which judicial district you're in, and again, that's the problem, is we have these different approaches throughout the state. They may say, no, no reasonable ability to pay, I'm waiving attorney fees, oftentimes court costs are not addressed. And if, those, if the judge is uncomfortable with that, then it, it's not ordered, it's not ordered, in the judgment entry, I am not ordering attorney fees, legal assistance fees, court costs, anything. When those amounts become known, um, they'll get filed and we'll either have a hearing or if you agree, we can waive the hearing. But at least up front, somebody has talked about it because what happens is that it then gets filed, you know, six months later, um, or however longer, I mean, sometimes it's a really long time. And that discussion is never held. Some of the orders that say, you now have to pay jail fees of $45,000, there's nothing in that order that indicates the defendant has the right to challenge it, whether it's reasonable or whether they have the ability to pay. And defendants are left out in the cold and nothing happens. And then we have court data. And I'm way over my time. I would ask that this court to uh, reverse his conviction and send this case back for determination of his real reasonable ability to pay. Thank you. Ms. Lucy, thank you as well. Ms. Trout. Good morning, Your Honors. Restitution 
is broken, but we can certainly do a lot or have a discussion about how to fix it. And what Be happens- Before you get there, can I ask a, a, a question? I'm reading this judgment, or this judgment in this case, and this court finds that the defendant had a reasonable ability to pay. Where's the evidence of it in this record? Where is anything in this record that shows he has a reasonable ability to pay? There isn't anything in the record other than what the court said in its order, which is a form. And then it said that the, the costs were to be assessed um, by the clerk. But what we're talking about in this particular case is only the assessment of the fine and surcharge and the court costs, which would be the sheriff's fee, the filing fee, and then the cost of an investigator for a defendant who is serving a life sentence. But the, pro the problem in this case is when you make a finding there's an ability to pay, then when all these, these amounts come in later, it's already determined that the defendant had the ability to pay, so you, you load up the full boat. Right, and I agree with you, Your Honor. I mean, I, as I said, we have a process in place where the statute sets forth a procedure, but the practice is, is not is where we have the problem. And, and if you look at, we have three more cases this morning. Yes. And they all found reasonable ability to pay with no evidence. And it seems to be like a form order out there. Well, I agree, Your Honor, because what's what's happening and, and is that the court finds that the defendant has the reasonable ability to pay and then the clerk is to assess those costs. And then once the clerk enters those costs in the financial section, the Department of Corrections, takes that information and then it will plan, it does its restitution plan of payment. And once they're, at, let's say at the DOC, you have your pre-deprivation hearing, but you have these amounts, which it's questionable whether there's actually ever been an order entered, an order that under 9107A constitutes a judgment. What's your remedy, how to fix this? Because we're doing something completely different than what the statute says, it th I think. Well, I think that the statute contemplates that uh, amounts where we have the temporary orders and that that will act as the order until such time as we have a final order. But for some reason, um, those amounts aren't getting to the district courts. And it, it's either that people don't want to deal with restitution or they think that the case, if the defendant has been sentenced, the case is over, or it's a matter of the clerks thinking that perhaps they have the ability to impose these costs because the restitution order, uh, the court has ordered restitution. So there's, we have to find where the disconnect is. And I think that the disconnect is that these amounts are not getting in front of the district court judges in order to make sure that these orders are in place. If, and if in fact, those orders are in place, the defendant is given notice, and that the defendant would have the ability to challenge those orders. Every time the court enters a temporary order, and that's, you know, that's under, well, it seems to me the statute contemplates everything should be there when the defendant sentence. In a perfect world, absolutely, and, yes. But they have this section 910.3, which allows temporary orders to be entered when they're not there. Yes. And uh, it seems under, are you proposing that whenever the court enters one of these temporary orders that aren't available at the time of sentencing that the defendant is entitled to a hearing? The defendant is or is not entitled? Is entitled to a hearing. If, I'm not certain of your question, if, if a temporary order is entered and then the before defendant- a, Before a temporary order is entered. Say the defendant's sentenced and they don't have the attorney fees. The attorney fees show up a month later. Before the court can enter a uh, temporary order on the attorney fees because there may be other things coming it, in. It would make no sense you, to you have, have a, to, you a have a You have to have a hearing. You, I, it makes no sense to have a hearing before the temporary order has been entered because nobody, as, as Justice Christensen noted, we don't have any numbers. It would, be, it would just be. But you have a temporary order. You, it contemplates more, a series of temporary orders. If you read 910.3, every time there's a mount, the court can enter a temporary order. Well, Your Honor, I think that the, the defendant could certainly seek to have a hearing. Whether or not um, the court would actually grant it is, is another thing. Well, but we, said you, Haines, we said in Haines you can't enter an amount until you determine reasonable ability to pay. Well, if you don't have the amount, how can you enter the, the temporary order? I'm saying at the time you're going to enter the temporary order, okay. 
Do you have to have a hearing before you can enter it? No, I think you have to have a hearing after it's entered to give the defendant the opportunity to challenge it. And that's what I think the statute calls for. Because when you look at 910.3, you look at 910.7, everything in 910.7 contemplates um, that the hearing would, the hearing is held after uh, there's an order or that, that the defendant wants to have some type of, of change. Uh, or seek a modification of that restitution order. So it would presuppose that you'd have to have the order in order for the defendant to challenge it. But, but we, we interpret that statute differently in 84, where we said, because we find that a sentencing court is required to consider the offender's ability to make the payments, we vacate the restitution order and remand for determination of amount with consideration of defendant's reasonable ability to pay the amount ordered. So it seems to me that if we're going to follow our first interpretation of the law, that before that amount could be entered, the court has to consider reasonable ability to pay. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding your question because I think that once my, my position is that once an amount is available to a district court, and it may or may not be at sentencing, that the court has the, re, has the obligation to make sure the defendant has the reasonable ability to pay before it enters. I, I agree with that. Um, and I think that that's what pa it, the statute would pass constitutional muster for that reason. Um, but before the, the, uh, before the amount is, is entered, are you, are you suggesting a second sentencing hearing such as, or? But I'm suggesting that the state files the attorney fees, the amount, the county attorney files or the whoever files it, the clerk files it, before the court can enter an order on those attorney fees, whether it be at the time of sentencing or it be 30 days later or 60 days later, my question is, do you have to have the defendant either waive the right to a reasonable ability to a pay hearing or have a reasonable ability to pay hearing? I think, Your Honor, that the court, I don't think that the defendant, had, the, the defendant would waive that. I think that the court would make that determination in the order, and if the defendant seeks to challenge it, then the defendant can challenge it. And if the defendant does so within 30 days, it's part of the original sentence, so the, so and, the every, and the defendant's entitled to counsel. The defendant has an order against him or her for cost without participating in the hearing, and his or her only remedy is to challenge it within 30 days to get an attorney or challenge it after that and not get an attorney. I, yes, Your Honor. I think that that's what the case law suggests. I think that that's what what the the court has said in in Allspock, and 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 also in Blank that we're going to these supplemental orders would come in, and if the defendant because there was a change in the sentence, uh, that the defendant would have the opportunity to challenge that within 30 days and still have it be considered part of the original sentence. In this case, did the court err in finding a reasonable ability to pay? The court, I think, was, I don't think it, it goes to the point of error, but I think it, it goes to the form of perhaps maybe um, elevating form over substance in that the court is required to impose the restitution. The court knows that the reasonable ability to pay is a consideration for that, yet the amounts were not known. So the court did what it is statutorily required to do without having the numbers. I'm trying to imagine, as a district court judge who's going to be reading whatever decision this court comes down with, trying to figure out, okay, how am I supposed to do things differently? Would you agree with me that if somebody wants to waive the time between plea and sentencing, that that's the defendant's request, and if the state wanted to do it and the defense said no way, it wouldn't happen. Sentencing would be down the road. Would you agree with me? That if the defendant wants to... If the state was the one to say, let's do immediate sentencing, and defendant said no, it's not going to happen. Would you agree with me? That's correct, yes. So would you also agree with me that most of these issues arise because defendant wants to be sentenced that, at that time, and the information's just plumb not available? I think because we have so many guilty pleas that occur right. in the state, yes. I, I mean, I think that that's the... What that I'm getting at, you. would there be, um, you're talking about form over substance, and my head is swimming with all of these, these um, issues, because as I know, that, that date of sentencing, what people are talking about is the sentence. Where am I going? When? For how long? That's what everybody's talking about. So would it be a simple, practical solution for there to be less waivers of time between plea and sentencing that would allow the court an opportunity to gather that information that now the defendant is complaining about not having on a date that he or she asked to be expedited. 
Your Honor, I think that that certainly is one way in which we can we can perhaps alleviate some of the problems that the district courts are having because these numbers aren't available. You know, I mean, the the district courts are, are put in a really tough position, I think, because they have to sentence these defendants. They have to impose restitution. These amounts aren't available. And and once they sentence these defendants, then they think, well, the, the case is over, but there's still this matter of restitution. And and perhaps it falls to the clerks to, to do these things. So yes, I, I mean, I think that we need to perhaps have the, have the district courts maybe consider restitution for sentencing and try and, and have all parties, county attorneys included for, for victim restitution, to have those amounts available um, at the time of sentencing, if at all possible. Now the case law and, and life is, is going to kind of throw a wrench in that in, in many circumstances, but, um, but the allowance for temporary orders um, would still occur but I think that the defendants, I think that what we need to do is have district courts enter these orders for amounts, and then um, if there are changes, then the defendant would, had, would have that opportunity to challenge it. That's the nice thing about restitution, is that a defendant will always or generally have um, some means or some avenue by which to challenge it. And um, under 9107, uh, excuse me, yeah, 9107, as Ms. Lucy uh, alluded to, was that, well, okay, there's a gatekeeping function in 9107 that if on the face of the petition a hearing isn't warranted, these defendants are, are foreclosed from raising these, uh, raising these issues. But if a defendant says the district court never made a reasonable ability to pay determination, perhaps that would be the way that uh, these challenges could get in front of the district court. Um, and I see, uh, Unless there are any further yeah, questions. Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on a question of Justice Wiggins. Are these judgments that have to be renewed every 10 years or else they're, they become uncollectible? That's, uh, that is, uh, you, you can't answer that question with a yes or no. And the reason for that is we have life sentences in Iowa. And as long as a person is serving a life sentence, uh, that judgment, that sentencing order is in effect. So the state submits that um, on these sentences that exceed 20 years for the length of what would otherwise be a judgment, that the judgment stays in place. For those types of sentences that are less than uh, 20 years, yes, we would agree that with the change in 9107A, that restitution orders are to be enforced in the same manner as a civil judgment, that um, it, would, it, it would follow along with, I think it's six, 14 or 626, 624, something like that. 9107A makes it a civil judgment. Basically. Correct. Yes, it does. But we're saying if you're serving a life sentence, that judgment doesn't expire. If there are no further questions, uh, the state respectfully requests that this court affirm Mr. Albright's conviction and the district court's sentence. Thank you. Ms. Trout, thank you as well. Ms. Lucy may present your rebuttal. Before you get going, I want to ask you the same question. Isn't the message we're sending, perhaps, um, state argued at the time of sentencing, this info should be available. But in all honesty, if we would do a, a search, many, many, many sentences occur on a non-sentencing day. So people don't know till they get there, this is turning into a sentencing. So would you agree with me that perhaps one um, easy, practical approach would be for the court to have a sentencing separate from the plea date? I think it really depends because if you look at it, this case was a trial, and by the time sentencing, we still don't have that information. That's true. That's true of this case, but I think as we've all said, we have a lot of cases right now up on appeal, and in general, we need to address this for all right. cases. And I agree, because um, I think I think you have some of my other cases where there may not be a delay. I, I think the problem becomes is that we don't know the amount. And then there's the form orders that say, we're going to enter that. And then the clerk, looking at the, the statutory authority, the clerk then goes ahead and assesses that. If you also look at how it... We could change the form orders. I mean, we it, could even do it in these opinions. Oh, I, I agree. Mean, I, I, the real question, it seems to me, is... What's the problem with a system that kind of puts the onus on the defendant 
to to say I look I understand there's an ability to pay determination but I don't have the ability to pay what's what's wrong with that there's a couple things wrong number one the code requires that the judge make that determination and in Coleman this court said that is the judge's job that is how we have these recoupment statues and restitution are constitutionally sound and two if you make it the onus on the defendant depending on which form order comes from whatever judicial district the defendant isn't even told that the defendant doesn't have counsel and the judge doesn't have any information to make a determination of reasonable ability to pay other than that initial financial affidavit that may or may not have changed at sentencing there can be a quick conversation has your financial situation changed if you're going to be on probation what other fees and obligations are you going to have but we still don't know the amounts right we, regardless of the ability to pay if you make that quick conversation you're still talking about an ability to pay an unknown figure right but that's where I go back to if all else fails if we're trying to, to do something that seems relatively balanced is I think you can pay up to this amount and no more and then maybe there's not another hearing but if you look at how indigent defense claims are submitted to the court if you go on EDMS and you go on Mr. Albright's ca case there is no document to click on an EDMS it is an electronic tr transfer or whatever that the clerk, I'm not even sure that the court can see. I am unsure of that. I know I can't. I double checked with F Franklin County yesterday. It's not something I can see. You're talking about court costs? Uh, no, I, I'm talking about the, the indigent defense claims. And you're correct. I don't believe they can see that. I don't know if anybody can see them. I would assume that if you have an updated ISIS password, you can get into the financial. Mine's currently expired. Um, you can get into the financial information and you can see what the court. Could but, you know, that doesn't help the defendant because he or she can't see that. I think that everybody agrees that court debt has become a problem. And the question becomes, how are we going to fix it that is feasible, whether that's through legislation, a court rule, or something? You know, in this case, we're not just talking about a fine, which he has to pay, and he has to pay that surcharge. That's not subject to reasonable ability to pay. We have court costs, and we have legal assistance fees, which was in the form of an investigator. And if you look at what's in the appendix of the combined general docket, that is not the final amount, but that's all we have for this appeal, because there's three indigent defense claims since I filed my limited appearance. The question becomes, whose duty is it? And it's the court's duty. And there are going to be situations where we're not going to have this long, drawn-out conversation about ability to pay. But if you look at the Dudley case, that is an example of what information should the judge have. What is the income? What are expenses? What's going to happen? You know, what else do you have? You know, do you have prospects of, of work? Are you on disability? Are you in prison for, for life? Are you in prison for 25 years where you have to pay 20% of your, um, your, your account? I guess I would question whether there is a pre-deprivation hearing for prison income versus outside sources. It is 20% of the account. There may or may not be a pre-deprivation hearing. And if you look at payments plans filed by DOC, they are no different than what the clerk has sent to DOC. There's not an, any indication of a total amount change. And I am over my time again. I'd ask that this court try to come up with a solution to this problem that is not going to go away. Thank you very much. Ms. Lucy, thank you as well. Ms. Trout, thank you again. The case of State versus Albright is now then submitted and the bailiff uh, may adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.